Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. Hi, Del. How are you today? I'm great, Roxanne. How are you? Good. So Del and I have a, a, a very, very long history. And, uh, you know, when uh, uh, she started, she had started in uh, employee um, benefits consulting, and we're going back quite a while, while ago. And I started in 2000, I believe. Del, you had come on around 2004 or, or five or so. It was actually about 2008. Oh, wow. So you see how the time uh, the time goes and you forget the time. So since then, um, obviously, uh, Del brought a lot with her at that point, but she has gone on and done some phenomenal things in uh, the arena of diver- diversity. So I'm going to hit the highlights. I'm sure, Del, I'm going to miss a lot, but uh, you can read her entire bio um, when we uh, send out the promotion for the podcast. Uh, so Delafonte Atkins is a learning and development development leader with the with professional experience in the human resources organizational development and learning spaces she has she's currently the director of learning equity and engagement and she's a trusted diversity equity inclusion and belonging advisor where she's involved in a number of initiatives in the corporate business sector as well as ongoing government related projects that that focuses on equity she has done some amazing things. She works um, as a part of a committee of 12 for the City of Toronto, confronting anti-Black racism partnerships and accountability circles, representing the interests of Black uh, people living in Toronto, living and working in Toronto. She uh, she is a speaker, moderator, and facilitator, and she leads discussions around the importance of equity um, in the workplace, such as Black on Bay Street and Leading for Excellence. She guest lectures uh, across Canada um, to different talents, and she's a recipient, which is an amazing thing, Dell. I didn't know this, of uh, the 2018 Top 22 Rising Stars Award from Human Resources uh, Director Canada. Amazing. She, you, you've done so much, Dell, since uh, we've actually been connected. Thank you so much, Roxanne. So thank you for spending the time. So um, you and I could talk uh, about so many things, but um, what I'd like to kind of preface uh, for the listeners is kind of how we met, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, our backgrounds. So um, so Dal and I worked together um, at uh, one of the biggest, um, it will be probably the biggest uh, health and wellness firm now across North America, uh, where we worked in the capacity of health and wellness strategy um, with psychological um, and emotional benefits that could uh, impede people's ability to um, stay actively at work. So we offered um, services to assist individuals to stay there. And since then, um, you know, we were talking at, just before we got on the line kind of about diversity and the impact that it would have had um, on ourselves, something we had never chatted about in our capacity back then. So Dell, um, so kind of, we're going to jump into that. So I want you to just tell people kind of the pivot, or I shouldn't say even say a pivot, but why why you decided to choose this particular element in related to HR to focus and and kind of um, direct your career in that way. Well, first, I want to say thank you so much for having me um, talk about this very important discussion, Roxanne. I agree. We've definitely come a long way. And uh, to be completely honest, uh, you definitely had an impact in terms of uh, the beginning of my professional journey and understanding what the corporate space looked like, what the environment was like, where I fit in or did not fit into that and and why that was. And essentially, when I started working with you uh, and supporting you, uh, within our space, I, it, it was very apparent to me that uh, we we were we were pretty much the only ones. We were the only ones that um, were in our space that probably would identify as a person of color. If not that, it was very just a handful of us uh, in such a large 
corporate environment, uh, an environment that takes care of people in organizations, that advocates for people, advocates for, for wellness and mental health, yet uh, we were part of a very underrepresented group. And I, I really wanted to understand why that was. And would that be the way that the rest of my personal journey, my career journey looked like? And I know that there's a number of phenomenal individuals around me, peers, colleagues, in so many different spaces and in so many different disciplines within the corporate environment. However, I don't see them. And I definitely don't see them at executive levels. And it sparked a bit of curiosity for me uh, to want to explore that a little bit more. And through my function uh, in other spaces, uh, you know, throughout HR organizational development, there became, it was a trend. You know, I continually saw the same things, underrepresentation uh, from people identifying with various diverse groups. And I decided that this is an area of interest for me, that um, I've always been a little bit of an advocate of sorts to just ensure that there is fairness, there is equity across the board, no matter what space I'm in. And I decided that I would, I think was probably in my best interest not only for myself, but my community and, and, and for Canada to, uh, to shed some light on that and, and to make some positive changes in this area. Amazing, you know, so I, I think I'm, I'm going to give you my perspective on, on when we work together in kind of the frame. So, of course, you know, I was an executive uh, and I was in that position. Oh, you're right. I was probably not only, you know, the only um, non-white individual at that corporate t executive table, but I, I didn't think about it back then. You know, it's interesting now I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, oh, wow, that that is so true. I hadn't thought about it. And Dell and I worked together uh, and I hadn't really thought about it then, but I think about some of the barriers that, ex that were there, but because I, I'm going to say had a blind spot or I had an invisible uh, air or eye to it, I didn't perceive it from that perspective. But now in retrospect, I realized that um, there were th things that um, stopped me probably from developing in a certain way because there was not the focus on diversity at that time. And I would totally agree with you. I think it was, even if it was, you know, 10, 20 years ago, it was a little bit of a different time. There, was as, there wasn't as much attention uh, paid, uh, you, you know, to the topic of diversity or inclusion back then. However, the issues were there. The issues were there, um, which has led to this movement um, at this point where, you know, there was recognition of some of those barriers, some of the systemic barriers, some of the very subtle um, and even unconscious um, barriers areas and biases that um, has, have existed since we've been working in this environment and, and in this country. Uh, and that has, yes, in some ways impeded um, our growth um, and us achieving our full potential. And so now I'm very happy that there's a, a lot more awareness about this and that we are working towards making some real change in this area. So let's, let's kind of talk about really, I mean, I'm going to tell you what I thought I experienced. And because like I said, I had the, I, I, I kind of said, you know, I'm different, but I don't, people don't perceive me as different. This is how I looked at it, Del, which is tell you kind of where my mental was in, in, um, in 2000 when I joined. Um, and I always kind of, you know, kind of, if there was a, if there was a barrier, I didn't perceive it as a, I just figured, how could I work harder? You know, so if there was a, you know, an account that I was having difficulty with, or if I was needing support or those times, I just used my professional background to work harder, which I know sometimes that's not always the case, right? Like it may mean, you know, you could bring every possible credential or experience with you, but there's barriers that is actually still exists um, that stops people from getting into particular positions. So tell me what, What's happening out there, not just in Toronto, but just kind of globe, like within Canada or even globally with uh, diversity um, compared to, say, maybe when I was, you know, starting in my corporate career in 2000? So I think that's a great question, uh, Roxanne. Uh, I think there's, first and foremost, a lot more awareness. I think people are starting to stand up and speak up and say, you know what, my experience in the workplace 
isn't as deal, isn't as ideal as it should be. I look around and I see my peers and I do see unfair advantages that my peers have that don't identify with me. And whether that is from um, a gender perspective, whether that's from a racialized perspective, it could be from an orientation perspective, a religious perspective, so many different identities that, uh, even abilities, right, that, that uh, make up who we are. Um, some individuals have a little bit more privilege than we do and some of that privilege isn't intentional per se, some of it is very systemic and it's been like that for a while. And so because of that, and we're working hard and, and women, as for example, are graduating from post-secondary institutions at a much higher and, and faster rate than even our male counterparts. However, we, our career trajectories don't, uh, don't reflect that. We're not moving up as fast as we should be. We're not attaining uh, the higher levels of, of responsibility and positions that we could be, that we're even qualified to do. And even more so, we're not earning. We're not earning uh, the same amount as our, our male peers or our male counterparts. And that even, um, the gap even widens when we incorporate uh, race and ability, et cetera. Uh, that, that gap even gets worse. So in paying attention to this and understanding this, there's become more of an awareness as people have been starting to share their lived experiences about what uh, what they go through in the workplace and how that affects, uh, you, you know, their self-esteem, that affects their confidence, affects their access to opportunities. And they're starting to say things need to change. So we've noticed that there have been diversity movements that have come to play. Uh, we're starting to incorporate that into policy all the way from a macro level inside or organizations to, a, um, sorry, a micro level inside organizations to a macro level from the government spearheading initiatives and, and making it a, a, a core objective to ensure that uh, there is inclusion across the board uh, within various sectors. And so uh, very specific uh, examples is there's more attention paid to uh, conscious and unconscious biases, uh, the emotional tax that, um, that happens uh, within the workplace um, and the effect, direct effect on mental health where there's individuals that feel like they have to try harder, but they're burning out because they have to try harder than others. Um, microaggressions uh, are, are being highlighted as well, those slights and, and passive aggressive jabs and judgments. Uh, you know, you speak so well, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked, or wait a second, you're a lawyer? Uh, how could you be a lawyer? Uh, things like that, and people are starting to speak up a lot more about that. And finally, the various privileges um, that uh, that's, that certain individuals have, and we all have privilege, but um, our, our system is, there are systems still in place that do privilege some uh, or give some certain privileges over others, um, and that that really impacts or negatively impacts, you know, certain groups that don't fall into those uh, those buckets. And so the education that's starting to come about um, and starting to lead towards real change um, and measuring that change is is kind of the new trend that has happened that is, has been different from what we experienced 10, 15, 20 years ago. So, you know, I, I really want to talk to you a little bit about the unconscious and conscious bias that employees might Give me an example of something like that, because I'm I'm curious because now you're making me reflect on 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 my situation, um, kind of you know what how might I have been exposed to that and not maybe been aware that it was um, a bias. So can you give me an example of something like that, Del? Absolutely. So there's a few that come to mind. One conscious bias, and I'm I'm a huge advocate about um, really also talking about conscious bias biases. Uh, unconscious biases is, is the popular theme, the popular trend, training everything about what we don't know, what our brains do to fill in gaps and, and to make assessments and assumptions about people before we actually fully have taken the time to, to get to know the truth. So, but before I get there, um, an example of a conscious bias is something as simple as there is a young woman and she's applying for um, a role. And in the interview process, uh, behind the scenes, she could be amazing. She could be honestly the perfect selection for this, this particular opportunity for the organization. But there is one concern that the hiring team has. Uh, she's young. Uh, she mentioned that she just perhaps got married, for an example, and she's likely within childbearing years. So because of that, an, a decision is made 
you know what? She's probably going to be perfect for the role, but she's probably going to have a baby soon within the next year or two. And I can't afford to do that. I need someone who's going to be committed and I need someone who's going to uh, be loyal and kind of stay on with us consistently for the next five years because we have so many projects going on. And that is not an unconscious bias. That is a very conscious bias. You know exactly what you're doing, exactly what you're saying, and you're actually choosing to discriminate um, based on a perception that you might have about an individual. And that directly impacts her opportunity um, and her ability to contribute to the workplace um, and to her career. Um, and that happens all the time. So that's one example of a conscious bias. And there's a lot of unconscious biases that come into play. Well, you know, there's uh, Veronica, for example, and uh, I know she's a new immigrant uh, and she came from China. And even though, again, her, her skills, her, her aptitude, she would be great to move to the next step for us to promote her in the organization. But English is not her first language. And I don't think that our clients are going to really pay attention to her if she has to deliver all those presentations that are required for this role because she has a little bit of an, a, an accent, right? And you know, that just could be, that could be deemed as a conscious bias, but it also, sometimes that assumption is, is had by just looking at the individual and assuming, you know, okay, she, she might be of Asian descent. She's not from here. She probably is, is not going to be, you know, great at speaking positions. That, that could be an unconscious bias. There's no, there's no, um, there's no evidence of that, right? Or it could be, uh, you know, I'm going to put this black man um, in in a development community to work on that particular project from right. a, in, in a poorer community, right? Because he's going to be able to relate or identify with with the people that live there, um, and so that's the reason why we're going to promote him into that position. Um, but that might not be his lived experience. But the perception that because he's a person of color, he would be more suited to fit that particular opportunity. Again, that could be based on an unconscious bias because there's no evidence of that and a decision ultimately being made because of that. So a lot of that does happen, unfortunately, in the workplace. And there's so many examples that we can name. But uh, and we are the givers of, of biases, conscious and unconscious, and we are also the receivers of it. Um, and so it's something that, you know, within my training that I do, it's helping us understand that this happens, we all do it, but how do we interrupt that process and how do we change the way that we think and, and start to recognize those blind spots that we have in order to uh, ensure that we're not making assumptions and we're not making detrimental or prejudice-based assumptions uh, for others, for, for our peers and for the people that uh, we work with in the workplace. That's such. That's so interesting because I can I can speak to each each and every one in in my different roles and the in the different you know in my career tra trajectory right right where sometimes I you know in one particular position it was you know well um, I'm coming back off mat leave and I could tell I could tell I was being treated differently and was it wasn't explicit but it was kind of an implicit feeling that I had to work three times as hard. Um, to be able to, to get back to the level that I was prior to leaving on that leave. And, you know, now I think back, I hadn't thought about that stuff. You, you know, when, when, you, when you're describing it, um, for me, I'm like, wow. You know, I just thought it was, you know, because everybody thought I had mummy brain. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if you kind of think about it now, I'm like, wow, it's interesting that some of these, you know, like little implicit things that are happening, you're not aware, um, like I said, and even in my time, you know, and at that time, I think I was, say, you know, 30, um, you know, to now, it's like you said, there's been a massive shift probably in the last 10 years. So I'm sure a lot of people are probably thinking, um, how, what was my experience? But like, to your point, like, how was I also judging? You know, Absolutely. you know, and I'm not being aware of my how I was judging people or, you know, um, you know, someone with an accent or someone that maybe has, um, you know, is dressed more traditionally uh, because of religion or someone, you know, that looked different from me. Because we all want to we all want to relate to somebody that we are in tune with. Would you agree that some of that, you know, we know that that's proven. Absolutely. So how, yeah. And how do we get past that? Because if, if everybody looks different. How do we educate, Dallas, my question, to just have people um, 
see it's about competence and capacity versus, you know, how I'm dressed or what the color of my skin is or um, whether I'm a young female that is going into my childbearing years or those types of things. How do you educate to kind of remove that barrier? I think that's a a phenomenal question. I also think that that's where we exactly need to start, right? Um, We understand what is, we understand that what our brains do, our brains all make assessments and and try to fill in gaps automatically. But what we, what we really need to do, I think, especially in the the corporate space is um, we need to be more exposed to what is different from us. Um, And, 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 of course, learn to embrace it, yes, but seek to understand it and not fear it. And I think um, some of the reasons why we haven't had more education in, in, in spaces and with individuals that identify differently from us is because it's human nature to also fear the unknown, right? But instead of, of backing away from it and only kind of surrounding ourselves with what's familiar to us, um, which is what, you know, humans tend to do, we can't afford to continue to do that in our environment, especially in Canada, especially in Toronto, where we're the most diverse community and society in the entire world. We cannot afford to do that. And before I just answer your your question, I do want to throw in a few stats for awareness, right? So the reason why we can't afford to do that is because by 2048, Catalyst, a major research firm, has also... uh, you know, predicted that the majority of people living in North America will be women of color. So wow. the, the, the demographic is absolutely going to shift within the next 30 years, right? And um, what we deem now as the minority will be the majority, right? And so we need to also start to put in place um, better tools, better mechanisms, but, um, and understand a lot more um, who we're going to be supporting and what the world's going to look like, not only from a community perspective, but also from uh, a business perspective. And so um, representation uh, matters. And that's a huge tagline. It's a huge, um, I guess, motto for me personally and professionally. Uh, and what I mean by that is no matter what space you're in and no matter what the decision is, If we take that from an approach that do we have adequate, do we have sufficient, do we have diverse representation that is contributing to this decision, right? Or is it homogenous? Is it typically, you know, a bunch of individuals that pretty much identify with each other and making the decisions for the masses, right? And that's how it's been. And that's why we've seen these challenges where people don't fit in. Uh, Decisions are made for us that as a whole that don't really benefit all of us as a whole. Um, And so the way that we can approach this from an education perspective, from a a corporate governance perspective, from a decision-making perspective on anything that we have to deal with within the workplace is, do I have representation? Um, Do I have representation from a gender lens? Do I have representation from a racialized lens, from an abilities lens, from a religious lens, from, uh, you know, from an orientation lens, whatever lens you want to you know, um, address? And do I have direct representation so that individuals can speak about their own lived experiences, what their needs, what their challenges are? Because we've also come from uh, an environment that those in power will speak for the masses, but they might not relate to what those experiences are. And it does everybody a disservice. And it does everybody a disservice from understanding better um, who we are and how we can go cohabitate, um, how we can uh, drive business and innovation along um, as peers. And it also very much derails from diversity of thought, which is really what gives us the leading advantage, the competitive advantage, not just in Canada, but again, from a business perspective. So we really need to ensure that uh, representation, adequate, diverse representation is at the table at all levels uh, to help us close those blind spots, close those gaps, and so that we are very much prepared for the future that we're about to live in. Wow, that stats, uh, I didn't think it would be that high, to be honest with you, but that's that shows you. So then um, we need that, um, you know, diversity just visibly in lots of different ways, not just racialized, like you said, religion, um, gender, um, all those things with, and especially with women, if it's, I forget what you said, 48%, that's, that's huge. 
It's actually the majority. So it's more than 48%, but that's by 2048. So wow. within 30 years, the majority of people living and working in North America, of course, including Canada, will be women of color coming from wow. all parts of the world, even gener generationally uh, Canadian as well. So what we, what we know to be true is the norm now is very much going to change. So I, you, you talked um, a little bit about, uh, you, you glossed on the term microaggression. And I think to the average person that doesn't know, they, they've probably heard that word, but I would like you to describe to people listening, what, what is a microaggression? Okay, so a microaggression essentially is, uh, it's a situation where there is um, uh, a comment, it could be uh, a judgment, um, whether it's verbal, nonverbal, it could be um, a slight, a snub, an insult, um, and it doesn't even matter whether it's intentional or unintentional, that essentially communicates a hostile, derogatory, negative message to a person solely based on their marginalized group status. So I know that that's a major definition um, or a long-winded definition, but essentially it's, it's an assumption or a prejudgment that's communicated to another individual um, that can come in the form of a comment or a look or, um, you know, a behavior that is exclusive in nature or, or neglectful that makes someone else feel inferior. And the way that that often can kind of show up is, is you know, you, you speak very well um, or you speak English very well. And then, you know, the, other, the person on the receiving end would say, well, what do you expect me to sound like? You know, um, why would you assume that I, that I can't be articulate? Right? Um, right, based on what I look like or based on where I'm from, etc. Or it could be, you know, anything from, I didn't, I could, I didn't expect that you have an education at this level. Or, um, oh, wait a second, why aren't you married at this at this stage of your life? Right? Why aren't you married? Does and, and with the implication that you know something wrong with you? Does you know? So there's so many things that we we go through. Or it could even be from a gender perspective. You know, we're about to have a team meeting and we're going to the golf course. Oh, you know, um, um, I, I don't assume that you would want to go because you know your woman type of thing. Right. right? right. Um, and this is happening on a regular basis. And I'll, I'll give you two very important stats um, that, that back up the, um, the regularity of, unfortunately, of microaggression. So uh, psychology today actually states that 64% of women have acknowledged that they experience microaggressions on a regular basis. And women are twice as likely as men to have to be mistaken for someone in a more junior position right? You walk into the room with a bunch of your peers and they automatically assume if the majority of your peers are men, that you are, are the ones supporting the men, yes. right? And not the other way around. And one other statistic, um, women of color, especially black women, right? Mm -hmm. Deal with a greater variety of microaggressions and are more likely than any other woman to have judgment, their judgment question in their area of expertise, Right. Wow. So they would have to explain more and more and more about why they've made a decision, why they're confident with this particular decision, no matter what level they're at. Um, and they have to actually do this more, which leads to emotional attacks and feeling drained and feeling stressed. And, and, and women are actually three times more likely to think about leaving their work simply based on the microaggressions that they face on a regular basis. So that's, that's like, I mean, when you think about that, like, I, I'm sure like if the, I, I'm in that stat, I've, I've had that happen to me multiple, I'm sure to some degree you too, but you, you know, you kind of think about, it. I'll give you the, some silly examples for me, right? Like, it'll be like, you know, I used to play Caravana every year Yes. and every year they, people would say, oh, are you going to live this year? I'm like, what, what do you mean? They'd say, well, you're going to Caravana, you know, people die at Caravana. I'd be like, uh, well, in Toronto, having worked with the police as my first career, there was a gun call every six, every, every six minutes in Toronto that was not related to Caravana, um, you know, because again, and then I'd be like, really? It's not because of Caravana. And here I'd be saying <laughs> that every year, but my friends are like, I hope you come back alive, you know, kind of thing. So that's a silly example. My friends would probably laugh because they know they say it to me, not, not in a malicious way. Yes. But again, it's like that perception, what happens in the Toronto Star, uh, Caravana Weekend, uh, you know, shooting at Caravana Parade, 
And I'm like, really? There's a gun call every six minutes in Toronto. Absolutely. You know? It's a perfect example of a microaggression. It's a, a perfect example of, of a bias. Somewhat unconscious, depending on who this, the sender is, but it also could be conscious as well. So that's, it's, it's a great example. And I think what you said was very key. A lot of what comes out isn't intentionally harmful right? Um, it may be just a joke or maybe actually be a valid concern, but mm -hmm. it's not rooted in truth. Right. And that's, that is the key. It's not rooted in truth. And it, what it does is it perpetuates, unfortunately, negative stereotypes and it perpetuates judgments um, and, and prejudices that are actually harmful to underrepresented and marginalized groups. And so that is what ultimately affects the quality of life and the lived experience, both in the community and in the workplace. And that's what we're trying to change. So, you know, what, I, what I'm interested in is, let's talk HR, let's talk, um, you know, we're talking from the government level to kind of the, you know, the frontline employee and how managers are going to create where how are you, how are you going to create shift i guess i, I want to know what is being done to create shift and from a global pers like a like a government perspective but also within uh the the hr departments in across toronto or across canada you know what kind of things are being done so that because obviously this is a huge issue and like you said a lot of times it's a, 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 um it's based on ignorance Mm -hmm. um, and lack of knowledge. So tell me some of the, the things that you do um, in your capacity to um, create this shift. Yeah, so um, it's, it's good to hear or good to know that um, I actually have the privilege of being involved in a few projects that are happening to make um, some of these shifts. Um, and it's based on the feedback that the community and, and us as, as citizens have, we decided to speak up and, and say, you know, some things need to change. So one that comes to mind is um, the, for, the former Ministry of the Status of Women Canada, I believe it's now the Ministry of Gender Equity um, and uh, Women and Gender Equity. Um, they have actually, um, are starting to put together um, a blueprint for organizations very specifically in uh, the private sector to acknowledge um, you know, gender equity um, and in leadership um, and, you know, and especially for women. And they recognize that there's a gap. They recognize that women are not able, due to various barriers, um, you know, subtle and very overt barriers to raise to the levels of, of leadership and, and governance that they really are skilled uh, and qualified to do. And so um, they're actually putting together a blueprint right now um, to help the nation uh, that will be released within the next uh, two years and businesses, you know, no matter what size, to um, look internally to see what are some of those, those challenges, what are some of the biases um, and barriers that are happening and provide practical tools to be able to help organizations who don't know what to do or, or who don't know where to start to, um, analyze themselves, gather the data that they need to understand what their current situation is and what areas do they need to work on and what areas do they need to educate themselves a little bit more around and what do they need to put in place in terms of implementation strategies to combat um, those uh, inequities that are happening. Um, so the government is very much involved in in and even putting resources in place uh, to ensure that there is some change. So and that's also happening from a pay equity standpoint, from a pay transparency standpoint, to again close those gaps where certain groups are uh, valued um, more than others for similar work um, that's being done. And then from um, a perspective in terms of what I do on a regular basis, um, I do a lot of workshops, training, conversations, uh, dialogues, uh, panel discussions um, to bring about a lot of awareness in this area to give um, what I would say is language to some of these things that happen to us that we don't know how, what to call them. So, you know, some of the experiences that we just shared on this conversation, because I've definitely gone through my own share of microaggressions and my own share of, of being on the receiving end of, of biases in the workplace and other inequities. But again, a couple of years ago, I didn't know that this was called a microaggression. Yes. And it's helping to educate others that, uh, so that they're able to communicate uh, to their HR teams what is happening to them right? Giving them the tools so that they can feel empowered to bring about change to better their, um, their experience. Um, I also, um, 
help to work with organizations and, and, and advocate for data uh, and, and measurement as um, an effective tool to achieve uh, the goals that are uh, that we're trying to set out and to push forward progress so that in five, 10 years from now, we're not talking about the exact same things and no change has been made. And I think that's one area that unfortunately us within organizations and us as a country in a whole, we're lacking a bit about. We don't collect enough data based on various demographics and based on um, various identities. And because of that, we get to sit a little bit of ignorance and plead it as bliss, right? Uh, we don't know how severe some issues are. We don't know how severe some inequities are because we haven't been tracking it and we haven't been measuring it. And we haven't been analyzing what we can't, what we haven't tracked and measured. And so because of that, uh, too much time goes by where we're allowed to have all these blind spots and nothing's done with them. And so now there's a big push in the HR um, uh, uh, space within organizations in the government space to start to track some of these inconsistencies. We wouldn't know that there is a wage gap and that, for example, um, women earn in Canada, as per the last Dads Canada report, 75 cents on the dollar to what men earn. Um, uh -huh. Right, and it the gap even gets worse. So, uh, those who identify as a newcomer and immigrant to Canada only make seventy one cents on the dollar. Those from racialized groups, it doesn't matter if you lived here for years and generations, or you, um, or otherwise, you only make sixty seven cents on the dollar. Indigenous population sixty five cents, and persons identifying of, as living with, um, you know. Uh, any disability, whether it's visible or non-visible, only make 54 cents on the dollar. But again, if we are not uh, measuring this, if we're not tracking this, then how can we see, um, you know, whether we're improving um, these numbers, whether we're closing that gap? So um, that's something that, again, we, we push for and we work with um, HR teams, but also with the government um, to be able to draw attention to that. Um, so interesting, you know, because uh, I don't know if you read any Malcolm Gladwell, but, uh, you know, I love his work. And if you've never read him, Dell, it's something to, to, to read. But uh, Malcolm spoke about, um, you know, with maestros, right? So people that lead or orchestras, um, they would, it was a predominantly male um, role, right? Maestros were always male. That was a known thing in orchestras. And then what they did is once, you know, they, they, they introduced a white screen. Right. So people would go behind and they would they would um, audition behind the screen. So there was this one, you know, I think, you know, where I'm going with the story. But this particular person was so phenomenal. It was apparently with the, they used the white screen and this audition was the best. They think that this person was one of the best um, maestros ever. Right. And then they, re they removed the white screen and it was a woman. Mm hmm. And um, that's where it's kind of the, the kind of the impetus to use white screen. So my thing becomes, right, when you tell me about these numbers, I'm, I'm a woman of, of color mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, did that, you know, I'm not thinking that happened to me. This is, this is my conscious brain saying that, but obviously the data is there to some degree. I'm educated. I've been in the field of, um, you know, psychology for over 30 years, but I've held various positions. And there's a part of me that wonders, did it happen to me? Or did it, did it not happen to me? And I guess that's my question, you know, like now we have a lot of, I think I'm going to say residual repair that we, have, we need to, to um, work on because if you have people that have kind of perceived that, you know, there are all these inequities, let's say as, a, as, a, as an ethnic person or a person that's of a different religion or whatever or gender, I would see that they, when you're shifting to create more inclusion, you also have to work with people that are coming into Canada or the, you know, into North America to kind of help them let go of perceived perceptions of biases to if we are creating that shift. Absolutely. So there is a lot of, there are a lot of flat factors at play and that's why there is really no silver bullet, no one standard way for everybody achieve, to achieve the same thing seamlessly. And I think that's again, why representation matters, why there needs to be healthy conversation and open dialogue and, um, and, 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 and open exchange of ideas um, so that we understand first and foremost, all of the different perceptions that are coming to the table and then work together to find a solution that is truly beneficial 
to to everyone and everyone who's contributing to this space. And um, again, you know, it's 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 we are up against um, you know historic systems that have governed um, the way things have been done for years and years and years here traditionally. But we're also um, up against so many different cultural norms that are also coming um, into the society as well that are um, impacting uh, you know the way that we are going to continue to see things but they see things also but for future generations right another identity often we forget is is age right and how age also plays into the workplace you know we have five generations working together all at once and it's the first time in earth's history that that has been happening so there are you know the way that the younger generations um, perceive the future and the way that they want to do things is very different um, from the way some um, some individuals have traditionally known it from from um, from more mature generations and so it it's finding a way to kind of create harmony. And ultimately what I say is a sense of belonging. And one thing I really wanna make key here is that, you know, there are the buzzwords of diversity and inclusion and we stop there. We stop at diversity and inclusion, right? Diversity is, you know, the, 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 the variety, right? The, the, the vibrance, right? All of the different things coming together, right? Um, and inclusion is making, you know, inviting, inviting everybody in. And we've been stuck there, but that really is not the end goal. The end goal truly is achieving a state of belonging. And that's why um, I say I'm a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging advisor, because I don't, my mandate is not to just stay with inclusion. Just because you're invited doesn't mean that you feel welcome. Mm -hmm. And too often we're stuck at just inviting people. I've invited you, I've hired you, now fit in, right? Uh, you should be grateful that you're here. Um, or, you know, uh, I invited you to the meeting, but, you know, you don't respect what that individual has to say or what their perspective is or their opinion. So that they don't feel a sense of belonging. What happens? Turnover. They leave. Right. right? And so it's because we're not making, achieving a sense of belonging um, the, the overall um, goal um, at the end of the day. And that's what I challenge organizations to really start to focus on. And belonging doesn't mean fit in. Belonging means come with whoever you are and all the di the identities that make uh, up who you are, all of the intersections, right? And, and, you know, we are going to not only embrace it, but how can we, how can we use those differences to our advantage? Not fear, uh, fear them or shy away from them, but also, you know, what do you bring to the table that I don't, that we can collaborate on and partner together to create something amazing? Right. And I think um, when people can feel heard, feel respected, feel valued, feel seen, that's what helps them be. Um, that's what helps us collectively achieve a sense of belonging. And that's where organizations need to go. If we want to make this amazing, diverse, multi-ethnic, multicultural demographic makeup of Canada work, um, that's where we, we essentially need to go. Wow. Beautifully said, because we figure that out uh, will be unstoppable as a, as a world power if you think about it, right? Because, you know, we have, you know, Canada, when I came to Canada, so I came to Canada in 1983. So I grew up in Trinidad. And um, so I was bringing a completely different cultural context, right? So people meet me and they say, well, you're Trini. And I know you know that, uh, hearing that term, and then they would assume certain things about me, right? So I meet another person and they don't know much other than, oh, you're from Trinidad. Like, what, what, what is it? But my, my reality was different. I was a foreign student, you know, I grew up elsewhere. I'd seen every person in power of a different color and um, had grown up around, you know, uh, people in power being different. So when I came to Canada and I listened to people's perspective, Dell, that threw me off. I was like, well, why can't your prime minister be black or brown or Chinese? Um, or my dentist was, you know, half white, half Asian, you know. So I grew up with that in my brain. And then I came here and then I went, whoa, this is a little bit different, mm -hmm. right? Um, we had colonialism in the Caribbean, absolutely. Where it was very, very definite. But you also had people that, you know, of, of every culture kind of as a rainbow, right? So, um, so it's, it's interesting, like you said, I, what did I want, you know, coming to Canada? I wanted to belong. Mm -hmm. that, that was all as a young, you know, teenager coming to go to university. That's all I wanted was to, to fit in. And it's so interesting that you say that because I, you know, what I talk about is authenticity and leadership. I talk about, you know, 
people finding that space within themselves to be who they need to be to show up and you know things will take care of itself and it's interesting that you're talking about belonging i love it because you know if 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 you invite people to the table but you make it uncomfortable how can they how can they give their gifts or share their gifts with you Absolutely. And you know what, honestly, Roxanne, we speak the exact same language in, in the spaces because every single thing you said and, and, and what you, um, you counsel around and you advocate for is exactly what I do as well. Um, and exactly what I say. And that's what, why I have these discussions because ultimately it's exactly that goal. Um, you know, I always say as just to support what you said um, is my true belief is that, you know, diversity is really what makes the world vibrant and beautiful. We all have gifts. We all have talents that we contribute. Um, and history always also proves I'm a historian as well um, by, you know, educated. And um, I say no one ever remembers the copycats. They only remember the originals. It doesn't matter if, you, if it's your favorite music artist. It doesn't matter if it's your favorite athlete. It doesn't matter who it is. You don't remember the people who copy each other and, and who sound the same as others. You remember those people who really stand out because they're being authentic mm -hmm. and they're being themselves yeah. and they are unapologetic about it. And, and that's what, you know, I hope to, um, Create, help to create spaces to empower people that they can be who they are and be valued um, and be um, appreciated and um, and own own that space um, that they're in um, you know while they're doing that and um, and that ultimately too is is one of the reasons why I do what I do. Well, Dal, this has been an ultimate pleasure. I you know I, I wish uh, to to stay connected so we can I can keep you know uh, abreast of what you're doing. Now, for people that are whether it's a CEO listening that thinks, wow, I I, I need to meet this young lady and uh, talk strategy to people that may be interested in having you having you uh, speak or do workshops or HR awareness, where, where, um, where can people reach you to be able to, uh, you know, um, get that support from you? Oh, great. Thanks, uh, Roxanne. I'm uh, more than happy to have anybody reach out to me. I can be found on LinkedIn um, under my name, Delafonte Atkins, and I will spell that because I know <laughs> it could be a little bit challenging for the average person. So it's spelled D-E-L-O-F, as in Frank, A-N-T-E. Atkins, A-T-K-I-N-S. I can also be found on Instagram at queen.della, so that's Q-W-E-E-N dot D-E-L-L-A, or on Twitter at uh, Queen Della, Q-W-E-E-N D-E-L-L-A. So um, more than happy to um, be able to, uh, to share anything with uh, anyone who's interested. Awesome. So if I can echo uh, Dell's words when I think about what I talk about in the workplace, you know, be real, um, be connected, um, bring your bring your uniqueness. That's your gift. You know, we, that's all we have. To Dell's point, we don't want copycats. We want the real deal, and we're one of a kind, like our our, our uh, fingerprints. So be real. Get out there. Make a difference. If you are different, um, like Dell and I both are, uh, you know, um, ethnically know that that's a gift and you, you bring so, so many things that you can give the world that the, girl, the world needs to experience. So again, uh, thank you for tuning in. And uh, Del, um, uh, I, I'm very eternally grateful for you uh, sharing your wisdom today. And look, I look forward with um, excitement to see what you're going to do out there in, um, in not just uh, you know, uh, on an HR level, but also on uh, a global level. So take care, Del. Thank you so much again, Roxanne. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxannederhage.com slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.